Lesson 7.5, we're moving away from calculating strict probabilities to now modeling random behavior using random variables and probability distributions. So we're going to start talking about different types of probability distributions. I would pause the video and write down these vocab words. So a little review, a discrete data, that is data that can be counted or only take specific values. Continuous data is data that can be measured, so like time um, or length. A random variable, our value of these variables changes according to chance. So if you have x is a discrete random variable, it means it's discrete, so x can be found by counting. It's random, so that means that x is the result of a random process. And then it's a variable, so in this case it can only take any value in the domain, and for this example the domain is 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. So the example that I pulled is number of failing percolators, and they call that x, and it could be anything 1, 2, 3, or 4. And then we're going to look at this probability distribution, which is the probability that x is 0, x is 1, x is 2, x is 3, or x is 4. So a probability, discrete probability distribution is a set of all possible values of discrete random variable together with their corresponding probabilities. So you have there all the possible values of the discrete random variable, and then we're going to be writing out the probabilities of each of those. Discrete probability distribution function, which we use our function notation f of t, assigns each value of the random variable to its corresponding probability. So f of t is equal to the probability that your random variable is equal to whatever t is. It's commonly referred by its abbreviation PDF, probability distribution function. For this first example, they give us this probability distribution function f of t is equal to t minus 2 over 15, where t is an integer, and it's something between 3 and 7 included. And we want to show that that defines a discrete probability distribution by constructing a table of values. So we're going to fill out a table, and we have the t values 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and we need to find f of t. So given our function and these t values, find f of t, and just leave your answer in an unsimplified fraction. So you if you plug them in, you should end up with 1 over 15, 2 over 15, 3 over 15, 4 over 15, and 5 over 15. So the way that we're going to use this to help us prove that it's a probability distribution is the fact that all of these should add up to 1 if this represents a complete probability distribution. So go ahead and pause the video and add all five of these up and see if it does in fact equal one. So if you add all of these up, you end up with 15 over 15, which is one. So what that's saying is if t is three, the probability that t happens by using this definition is one over 15. The probability of four is two over 15, so on and so forth. So if this probability distribution works for this entire domain of 3 to 7, then this should include all the possible ways of probabilities, which means they should add up to 1. And since this does add up to 1, this is in fact a probability distribution. So now we want to represent this probability distribution with a bar chart. So bar chart is not a histogram. Histogram means your bars are connected. This is a bar chart, so they're not connected. So your x values are going to be just 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then the y axis is going to be f of t. It's going to be its y coordinate. So represent this using a bar chart. So I just made a bar chart here. I have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 on the bottom. And then the probabilities, I plugged them in and found them as decimals. And that is basically kind of like your frequency. That's how high they're going to go, because that's the probability of it. So for this next example, it says that we're throwing a fair four-sided dice, one through four, and a fair six-sided die, one through six. The discrete random variable s is defined as the sum of the two numbers. So we want to construct a probability distribution of s as a table of values. So that's what we did on the previous one. We don't have a function here. We're just going to be calculating the probabilities and then also a bar chart. So in order to do the first one here, I would suggest making a sample space diagram that represents the sum of these two dice, and then using that to create your table of values, and then using that to write your bar chart. So go ahead and pause the video and do parts A, I, and double I. So I have my sample space diagram. Um, dice 1 is 1 through 6, dice 2 is 1 through 4, and so then the totals range from 2 to 10. And then my probability distribution as a table of values is all the different possible outcomes, so 2 through 10, and then the probabilities of each of them. So 2 and 10 are 1 out of 24, 3 and 9 are 2 out of 24, 4 and 8 are 3 out of 24, and 5, 6, and 7 are all 4 out of 24. 
So if you haven't already done so, go ahead and pause the video and make a bar chart. So here is the bar graph, um, the probability distribution, so it's nice and symmetrical here. So the next part we want to do is we want to write a piecewise function. So unlike the previous example there were, where there was just one function that could represent the entire uh, situation, in this case different parts are going to have to have different representations. So we want to kind of come up with some kind of pattern. So pause the video and see if you can kind of come up with some function that can represent this situation. So this one's a little bit tricky, but if you look, there's actually a pattern between the ones from 2 through 4. It's always whatever the s value is, minus 1 over 24. So s minus 1 over 24 for 2 through 4. For 5 through 7, it's always just 4 over 24. So I just said 4 over 24 for 5 through 7. And then for 8 through 10, it's always the opposite here. It's actually 11 minus whatever the s value is. So 11 minus s over 24 for 8 through 10. And then I also said that s has to be an integer. You can't take like 8.5 or something like that. So this is the piecewise function that represents this probability distribution. So now using all of this information, find these three probabilities. Find the probability that s is greater than 2, the probability that s is at most 6, and the probability that s is less than or equal to 6, given that s is greater than 2. So go ahead and pause the video and do part B. So the probability that s is greater than 2, that means it's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. So the only one that it can't be is 2. So I found the probability that s is greater than 2 by saying, OK, that's the same thing as it's everything except for 2. So 1 minus the probability that it is 2, because they have to add up. You either are 2 or you aren't. Um, so 1 minus 1 over 24, so the probability that s is greater than 2 is 23 over 24, or 0 0.958. For the probability of at, least, at most 6, that's 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, so then I just added all of those probabilities up and ended up with 14 over 24, or 0 0.583. For the last one, it says the probability of s is less than or equal to 6, given that s is greater than 2. So our conditional probability, the and divided by the probability of the second one, so the probability it's less than or equal to 6 and greater than 2, um, divided by the probability it's greater than 2. So I did the probability of s is less than or equal to 6 and greater than 2. That means it's 3, 4, 5, or 6. So that's 13 out of 24. And we're going to divide that by the probability that s is greater than 2, which is 23 over 24. So you end up with 13 over 23, or 0 0.565. So these probability distributions here, we have a table, we have a bar chart, and we have a um, piecewise function that all represent the probability distribution. And then we can use that to help us find our probabilities. So this next example, they give us a probability distribution of a discrete random variable u defined by p of u equals u is equal to k times u minus 3 times 8 minus u, where u is 4, 5, 6, or 7. So th that's the domain. That's all that u can be. And we want to find the value of k and then draw the probability table distribution of u. So first thing we need to do is find the value of k. Keep in mind that all the probabilities, when you plug in 4, 5, 6, and 7, have to add up to 1. So use that to help you find the value of k. So the first thing I did is I found the probabilities of 4, 5, 6, and 7 with this k value. So the probability of 4, I just plugged in 4 for u and got 4k. The probability of 5 is 6k. The probability of 6 is 6k. And the probability of 7 is 4k. Well, if this is a probability distribution, I know that all the probabilities have to add up to 1. So I'm going to add all of these up and set them equal to 1. So if you haven't already done so, use this to help you find k and then actually find the actual probabilities. So I added these up. You got 20k is equal to 1, which means k has to be 1 over 20. So then I just plug those in for k here. So the probability of a 4 is 4 out of 20 or 1 out of 5. The probability of 5 or 6 is 6 out of 20. And the probability of 7 is also 4 out of 20. In 100 tiles, we want to calculate the expected values of each of these possible outcomes. So whatever this is happening, it happens 100 times. And so given these probability outcomes, we want to find the expected frequency or the expected values. So go ahead and pause the video. And given the probability and that it's 100 trials, find your expected values for all four of these outcomes. 
So remember, when you find expected value, expected value is the number of trials times whatever the probability is. So if we want to find the expected frequency or the expected number of outcomes um, for a probability of 4, that's going to be 100 trials times the probability of 4, which is 4 over 20, which ends up being 20. So you would expect that 4 would happen 20 times, 5 would happen 30 times, 6 would happen 30 times, and 7 would happen 20 times. So part C, we want to find the mean value of u found in these 100 trials, assuming that the frequency of each outcome is our expected value. So this is going back to chapter 3. We have our 4, 5, 6, and 7 are our outcomes. That's our data. And then 20, 30, 30, and 20 are our uh, expected frequency, but it's going to be our actual frequency. So this row here is going to be our frequency, and this row is our data, and we want to calculate the mean. So go ahead and pause the video and do that. So our mean value would be 5.5. So I calculated that by assuming that 4 is going to show up 20 times, 5 is going to show up 30 times, 6 is going to show up 30 times, and 7 is going to show up 20 times, divided by the 100 possible outcomes. So you end up with 5.5. So now we want to interpret that our answer. What does that mean? So this is our mean. Even though 5.5 is not in the domain, the domain is just 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, um, it represents the central value. So remember, mean is central tendency, so it represents the central value of the 100 trials in this distribution. Expected value of a discrete random variable is represented by this thing that says e of x is equal to mu, which is equal to sigma x, where x times p of x equals x. What that just means is on the previous slide, we found the expected value of each of the four different outcomes. If you add all of those up, that is the expected value for the entire discrete random variable. So find the expected value for each outcome, add them all up, and that is your expected value for your discrete random variable. So this example says a news agent in Oxford takes delivery of six copies of a Scottish newspaper each Sunday. The news agent has a regular order for her customers for three newspapers, but sales vary according to current events, sports, etc. The news agent has collected data over several, several years to help predict her sales, creating a probability distribution table for random variable S, the number of Scottish newspapers sold on Sunday. So here's her probability distribution table. And so we want to find the expected number of newspapers sold and interpret its meaning. So using this, find the expected number of newspapers she will sell on Sunday. So to calculate the expected value for these newspapers, you again just calculate the expected value for each outcome and add them all up. So 2 times the probability of 2 plus 3 times the probability of 3, so on and so forth. So I did that here, and you end up with 3.83. So that's the expected value. Given this situation, what would you expect the outcome to be? We would expect it to be 3.83. So what that means for her is that on a typical Sunday, she should expect to sell more than three newspapers. 3.83, obviously you can't sell 0.83 of a newspaper. So even though three is the highest probability, there's more than a 50% chance that she'll sell more than three. So for this last example, students have a meeting to design a dice game to raise funds for charity as part of a uh, CAS project. Some of the decisions in the meeting are lost, and we have an incomplete distribution table. So what's going to happen is there's a cash prize here. You can earn $1, $2, $4, $6, or $7. And then the probabilities for $1, $2, and $7 are given, but 4 and 6 are lost. They do remember that the probability expected value is 67 over 20 and that the probability distribution function can be generalized using a linear model. So using that information, we want to find our missing probabilities. Remember, all probabilities have to add up to 1, and then they're also giving us our expected value. I used A and B to represent our missing values. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can use this information to figure out what those two missing probabilities are. So I set up two systems of, or a system of equations with two equations. The first one is knowing that this is a probability distribution, means that all of my probabilities have to add up to 1. So 11 over 40 plus 1 over 4 plus a plus b plus 1 over 8 is equal to 1. And then the other equation I used was the expected value equation. So the value times the probability. So 1 times 11 over 40 plus 2 times 1 over 4 plus 4 times a plus 6 times b plus 7 times 1 over 8 is equal to 67 over 20. So now we have a system of linear equations. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and pause the video and solve for a and b. 
So I solved this system of linear equations using elimination. I simplified this equation over here. I added all this together, combined like terms, and got a plus b is equal to 14 over 40. And then this one over here, I did the same thing, combined like terms, simplified, I got 4a plus 6b is equal to 68 over 40. And then I used elimination. I multiplied this equation by a negative 4, eliminated a, got 2b equals 12 over 40. So b is equal to 3 over 20 or 6 over 40. And then for this one, I plug that back in for B and got A to be 8 over 40. So the probability for 4 is 8 out of 40, and the probability for 6 is 3 out of 20, or you could simplify them in some way. So that was using the fact that all the probabilities had to add up to 1, and they gave us the expected value. So the last part, part B, says find the smallest entry fee the students could set for playing a game in order to predict or to have a profit. Um, comment on the advantages or disadvantages of a number of possible entry fees. Keep in mind that a fair game would mean your expected value is zero. They're telling us that the expected value is 67 over 20. That would be the um, expected prize because that's what our x value is. So our expected prize would be 67 out of 20. So if they're expecting to give that out as the prize, what should they charge in order to have a profit? So if the expected prize would be 67 out of 20, because again, that's what the expected value is, that's $3.35. So that's what we're expecting that we're going to have to pay out as prize money. So if we want to make money, then that means that each person, if they we're expecting that we're going to pay out $3.35, if we want to make a profit, we need to charge at least $3.36 to make an expected profit. Now, what you actually charge, you know, $3.50, whatever, that would just be extra profit on top of that. Um, but this is the expected value, so this would be your break-even point. So anything above that, you would expect to earn a profit. So this has been probability distributions and representing situations um, with probability distributions on tables with functions and bar graphs and using that information to help you find probabilities and expected values.